Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we've been recently talking about this idea of radius of curvature, and in this video, we're gonna actually derive how to find the radius of curvature given any arbitrary path. So how this relates to uh, dynamics is that particles or objects travel in arbitrary directions, and if we can map out that path in terms of an equation that is dependent on maybe y and x, then we can use that equation to derive the radius of curvature for any point and actually find the centripetal acceleration of the particle or object at any given point on the path. So the first thing we're gonna do is actually define some arbitrary paths. So I'm gonna define one that looks like this. So this is the path of a particle. And the next thing we're gonna do is actually define a point that we're interested on um, to find the radius of curvature. So this, let's take this arbitrary point right here. So if we want to find the radius of curvature, what we have to do is actually draw a circle tangent to that point to the graph. So I'm going to define the circle's radius, so this is about the center, so this is going to be the radius right there to that point tangent to the graph, and the radius we're going to define as rho. And the next thing we're going to look at is this idea of the tangent line to that given point. So we're going to define this angle relative to the horizontal axis and the tangent line to the point that we're interested in as phi. And this angle right here actually relates to the radius of curvature and how the radius of curvature changes over time. So now I'm going to show you how this angle relates to the radius of curvature. So this is just a very uh, simple geometric problem. So the first thing I'm going to define is actually this vertical line that passes through the center of the circle. And also, I'm going to draw a vertical line that passes through the point that we're interested in. Since both these black lines are vertical, we can also say that they're parallel as well. And I'm also going to extend this red line a little bit farther so we can see how this angle relates to the radius of curvature. So in a video prior, be sure to check that out if you're confused by this, but we could say that this angle right here is actually equal to this angle right here. And since that is true, we can actually treat these two lines and this red line as a transversal diagram. So what that means is that we could define this angle right here also by phi. And another thing we can also do is actually define this angle phi in terms of the path's derivative. And that's simply because this green line is tangent to this the path that we drew earlier, which is gray. So if you look at the ratio between the change in y to the change in x, uh, we could look at this right here. So this is the change in y and the change in x. It doesn't matter how large you draw this triangle, the ratio we re will remain the same. If we understand the ideas of derivatives, we can actually define this infinitesimal uh, triangle. So this is going to be dy dx with an angle of phi, and we could define phi using trigonometry. So we could say that tangent phi equals dy dx. And this is going to be crucial when solving for the radius of curvature later on. And one thing I forgot to point out is that this radius right here is going to be perpendicular to the tangent line that we drew here. So that goes for the same for this uh, diagram right here. Okay, so I redrew the picture. I know it looks a little cluttered, but really what's going on is that we have this path that is in gray right here, and an object is moving from this direction to this point right here. And I drew two different states of the radius of curvatures. So you can see that this is the first state, this blue circle is the first state, and the red circle is the second state. So if we want to see how the path of curvature changes as the particle moves from one point to another, what we can do is actually look at the change of the angle and relate that to the arc of the circle. So what I'm saying is that we can look at the change in the angle, which is going to be phi prime minus phi, and that'll give you the change in the radius of curvature. Now let's say if we take this difference and take the limit as delta phi goes to zero, of you know phi prime minus phi, what we get is an infinitesimal, which is d phi. So basically, if we let that change in angle, change in phi, get really, really, really close to zero, what happens is that the circles start overlapping each other, or they start being coincident. So this very, very small angle is still the change in phi. So if we allow the limiting case, which is delta phi going really, really close to zero, what happens is that the circles start overlapping each other. And what we can do is actually treat the change as if it was one circle. 
So what we can say is that this radius rho is basically the radius of both circles when it comes to the limiting case, which is delta phi approaching zero. So we could say that this very, very small change right here across this delta phi, this arc length, this very, very, very small length is going to be um, ds. And as we learned earlier that the arc of a circle can actually be defined as the radius times the angle at which the, where the angle is the sector that we're looking at. If you don't understand what I'm saying, so let's say we have a circle and if you wanted to find the, the arc length right here, um, this length from here to here, what we can do is take this radius and this angle and multiply them and you get this length s. So we could do the same exact thing. In the limiting case, we could say that this very, very small change in the arc length, which is basically the two circles coinciding with each other, equals the radius rho times d theta, or, the, or d phi, which is the very, very small change between the two circles. So again, this equation is going to be useful later on. So what we already found is that tangent phi is equal to the derivative of y with respect to x, and we found that the change in the arc length as the radius of curvature changes along the path is related to rho times the change in phi. I keep writing theta, but I mean phi. So with that being said, we can actually define ds in terms of the differential dy dx. So if we understand that ds is this very, very, very small change, so let me explode that out. If that's this very, very small change, um, ds, that curves just a little bit, as it gets very, very close to zero, what we can do is actually relate this to the differential dy dx. And that's simply because as ds gets closer and closer to zero, it starts becoming more and more straight. So we could actually define that very, very small length in terms of a right triangle. And that very, very small length of these triangles are actually dy and dx. And this length being right here is ds. So by using the Pythagorean theorem, what we can say is that ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared. And all I'm going to do is actually find ds. So all I have to do is take the square root. And now this is going to be a little mathematical trick. It's not obvious, but what, what my intention is, is actually find a relationship with ds with the derivative of y with respect to x. So what I'm going to do is actually um, factor out a dx squared, and we'll see what we get. So all I did was factor out this dx squared from this equation, and what you get is this. And what you can see is that now this is in terms of dy dx instead of just dy. And since this is under a square root, we can actually pull out this dx squared by saying the square root of dx squared is just dx. So we can rewrite ds in terms of this. So now we have everything we need to solve for the radius of curvature. So we have this tangent phi equals dy dx. We also can define the change in the arc length of the radius of curvatures with relation to the radius rho times the change in phi. So we could say ds equals rho d phi. And then we also found a relationship between the arc length, or the change in the very small arc length, is equivalent to the square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity squared times dx. And now we could use this to find rho, or in other words, the radius of curvature. So now we have everything we know, and now it's just a process of just plugging in variables and solving for rho. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually relate these two equations in terms, which is in terms of the arc length. So I'm going to say rho d phi equals the square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity squared times dx. And what I'm going to do is actually move this dx over to this side so we get rho d phi dx equals the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared. Now that we have that, we actually have to find this derivative, because that's what this is, d phi dx. And the only equation that we could do that with is actually this tangent phi equals dy dx. So we're going to take the derivative of tangent phi, 
with respect to x. So the last part of this equation simply equals uh, the second derivative of y with respect to x. And that's nothing too surprising, as you can see. So if you take the first derivative and then you take the derivative again, you get the second derivative. Now what we have to do is actually take the derivative of phi with respect to x. So the derivative of tangent, so let's just isolate this real quick and only look at this part of the problem. So the derivative of tangent is simply secant squared phi. And then we have to do the chain rule. So that's going to say that we're going to multiply this whole thing by d phi dx. And then this is going to equal the second derivative of y with respect to x. Now there's one thing we need to know. This is just a trigonometry uh, identity. And I proved this on my channel, so there will be a link in the description or on the video right now to you to see this uh, proof of this identity. And that is that 1 plus tangent squared uh, theta equals secant squared theta. And the reason why this is useful is that we can actually rewrite this secant squared phi in terms of tangent squared plus 1. And the reason why we want tangent is because we know that this uh, tangent phi would actually be related to the first derivative of y with respect to x. So that's why this is very useful in this equation. So what we can say by using that logic is that this is going to be 1 plus tangent squared phi um, times d phi dx equals the second derivative of y with respect to x. And we said that tangent phi actually equals dy dx. So what we can say is that this right here equals 1 plus dy dx quantity squared times d phi dx equals the second derivative of y with respect to x. So now I'm going to isolate d phi dx. So what we're going to get is uh, d phi dx equals uh, the second derivative of y with respect to x divided by 1 plus dy dx quantity squared and that's going to be d phi dx. Now what I'm going to do is actually plug this value into this equation right there. So what we're going to get is phi times, which equals the square root quantity. So all we have to do to find the radius of curvature, which is rho, is actually divide by this quotient right here, and we get our answer. Um, one thing I'm going to do actually is rewrite this square root in terms of an exponent so you guys could see this more clearly. So this right here, so this right here can be just written to the one half power. And the reason why I'm doing this is because this right here is to the first power and these are basically the same thing. So when I add these two together, I'm basically adding one over or two over two um, plus one half. So if we isolate rho, what we get is this. So this right here will give you the radius of curvature for any given path that is defined by some function of y with respect to x and we can find the radius of curvature. So the only thing that there's a problem with is that this quantity right here will sometimes be negative. And that's because uh, the second derivative will change depending on the path. This, however, this part of the equation will always be greater than zero. And that's simply because the dy dx being squared will always be positive. And if you add a positive 1 to that number, you're going to get a positive number. And if you do the third, three halves the root of that number, you're going to always get a positive number. So no matter what, the numerator will always be positive. But we cannot say the same thing for d. Uh, the second derivative of y with respect to x. So if we go back to what we learned in calculus, we remember that the, the sine of dy dx, or the second derivative of y with respect to x, is just signifies the, the concavity, concavity of the curve. So if we do get a negative value, that will give us a negative radius of curvature, but that in, the, in a physical sense doesn't make sense because there's no idea of negative distance. But what the negative actually signifies is the concavity of the curve. So if we look, for example, this arbitrary path of a particle, um, the, the rho would be pointing in the concavity of the curve. So as you can see, the rho for this point on the path 
is going to be negative and that's because the concavity of the curve is going downward. But if you look at this point later in the path, the row is going to be positive because the concavity of the ca uh, path is positive or concave up. So now that we understand that this quantity, the second derivative of y with respect to x, just signifies the concavity of the curve, the sign of the second derivative just signifies the concavity of the curve, then we, then we can rewrite this equation so that it makes sense because we don't want any radius that is negative. So we can rewrite this equation as... And the reason why we use the absolute value signs is just we get rid of that negative sign or the potential of being negative for the second derivative because all that negative sign does is signify the concavity of the path. So this right here is actually the true definition of the radius of curvature for any given point for a path that is defined by some function of x. So hopefully that wasn't too complicated. If you're still confused, I recommend you rewatch the video, take your time and digest each, every, each and every part because it is qu quite complicated. But this equation right here can be used for a lot of dynamics problems because we're going to figure out later that particles will be defined in arbitrary functions with respect to y and x. And we can use that to find the centripetal acceleration because we know the radius of curvature at any given point of the path. So that is why we're deriving this and we're going to be using it later on in the future. Now, um, I wouldn't recommend you solving this or deriving this on an exam, let's say. I mean, unless you forgot and you need the equation, then I recommend you actually understanding this process and you having to derive it for an exam. But my re sincere recommendation is just to memorize this formula. It'll be more convenient when, it take, for, when you're taking the exam. So hopefully this video helped you guys with uh, your studying of dynamics, and I'll see you in the next video.